Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Um, yeah, I definitely didn't expect this many people to show up, so it's just really encouraging and partly terrifying, but mostly exhilarating, which is really, really great. Um, yeah, uh, so my name's Martin, as Rachel introduced me. Um, during the day, I work as a consultant at NAUS Group, and we try and use data to have a positive influence in the world. But yeah, I've also made Buckley's and None, which is a, a forecast of the Australian election, and you can check that out at buckleysandnone.com. If you want to follow along, I've put my slides up at buckleysandnone.com slash pycon, which just takes you straight to a GitHub notebook. Uh, they haven't read it perfectly in there, but you'll still be allowed, able to follow along. Um, I wanted to be really clear up the top what I hope you'll get out of my talk. So there are two key things. One is that I hope you'll understand some of the benefits of probabilistic forecasting, um, understand what that is, understand why it um, can really help you give a great idea of the uncertainty around forecasts that you might be making or models that you're trying to build, um, how it can help you make decisions and make your assumptions really clear. Uh, the second thing that um, I hope you'll be able to see is how easy it is to build models like this in PyMC3. So it's a great Python library that um, does a lot of the back end stuff for you so you can really worry about how your model's defined and um, designed. My talk will have three quick sections. One, just describing probabilistic forecasting and its benefits. Second, defining the problem so that everyone's on the same page about how Australian elections work, because I understand not everyone's as much as a political junkie as me. And three, building a model in PyMC3. I did want to say just at the top as well, while the talk's called Forecasting Australia's 2019 election, and I'm very interested in politics, today I'm just really using that as an example so you can understand how probabilistic forecasting works more generally. And I'm sure you have really interesting and wonderful problems that you'll be able to apply this kind of thinking to and build models for. Uh, so first, what is probabilistic forecasting? So rather than trying to identify the single most likely outcome, probabilistic forecasting tries to estimate the relative probabilities of all possible outcomes. A real obvious and uh, common example of that is in weather forecasting. So rather than just saying whether it will rain or not rain on a particular day, weather forecasts provide us with relative probabilities of that, that outcome. So the chance of rain being 30% and not raining being 70%. And I just wondered across the room, if you saw a weather forecast like this, how many of you would bring an umbrella? One, you're all a risky crowd, maybe a few. <laughs> would you be, who would be surprised if it rained on a day where it said that there was a 30% chance of raining? You'd be surprised, a few people would be surprised. Keep that in mind as we kind of go along. Why would you want to forecast probabilistically? I'd say the key reason is that the future is uncertain. And if you take anything away from what I say today, let it be this somewhat convoluted sentence that is, sometimes something other than the most likely outcome happens. So sometimes when, it, sometimes when the forecast says there's a 30% chance of rain, it will rain. Sometimes when Donald Trump runs for an election, and a, I didn't forecast this, but a website in the States 538 had a 30% chance of him winning, sometimes that happens. Sometimes when you're in an exam and you guess a multiple choice answer, sometimes you'll get that right. You have a 25% chance of getting that right. So sometimes something other than the most likely thing happens. And so probabilistic forecasting can give you a really, really clear idea of the uncertainty associated with your prediction and the difference between how likely different outcomes are. So this is the one slide of, I guess, pseudo bragging that I have today. There won't be too much of it. On the left-hand side, you have uh, uh, the forecast from news polls. So they don't just do polling. They also put out forecasts. And they said that the coalition would win 65 seats. Labor would win 80 seats, and six seats would go to the crossbench, and the margin between the two major parties would be 15 seats. On the right-hand side, I've got a figure from Buckley's and none. And so across the bottom, we've got a whole range of different possible outcomes, from the Labor Party winning 36 more seats than the coalition, all the way through to the coalition winning 36 more seats than the ALP. 
And I've highlighted that same point where the ALP wins 15 more seats than the coalition here. And you can see that we gave that specific outcome a 5.1% chance of occurring. And outcomes more extreme, the Labor winning a higher margin than that had lower probability than 5.1, and less extreme had more probability of happening. And so there's two things I want you to, well, the one thing that I really want you to take away from this is that this gives you a really clear idea of the different possible outcomes of what can happen before something has actually occurred. Um, the other thing that I think is less important but is also relevant is that our, the peak of our distribution was actually closer to the actual outcome which is over here where the coalition won nine more seats than the ALP. The second great reason to do some probabilistic forecasting is that you can use these probabilities you've generated to make decisions. So one person was uh, brave enough, I suppose, or de depending on how you define bravery, to bet $1 million on Labor winning the federal election. Um, and hopefully you can see that it might just be a, a touch small, but um, the Buckley's and Nunn forecast had different probabilities for what was going to happen at different points throughout the election campaign. But if I took the most optimistic view of what was going to happen with respect to Labor winning, we had them at a 70% chance that they would win and a 30% chance that the coalition would win. That's sort of, the, I think, the best you could ever have looked at our forecast and seen for the ALP. And so if you take those two numbers, a 70% chance that the ALP win, and for this punter, it was that they would win $230,000. So 230 times 0.7 plus all the chance of losing a million dollars, a 30% chance of losing a million dollars, you can quite clearly see that it's not worth taking that bet. And hopefully, it's also just not worth betting on elections, period, one way or the other. <laughs> So there are two reasons. One, the future is uncertain, and so classifying uncertainty or estimating uncertainty is really important. Two, uh, it can, you can take your probabilities and use them to make decisions. The third, which we'll see as we go along, is that um, you have to make your assumptions clear when you're going into probabilistic forecasting, and that can be really helpful because two people can have really different assumptions, and you have to say what they are before you get started. So two. Um, defining the problem. So what was I actually trying to do with Buckley's and Nunn? Uh, primarily, I was trying to forecast before it happened who would win the federal election. And that's decided by the House of Representatives, which is made up of 151 seats. So there are three, at the end of the day, there are three primary outcomes that I had. One was that the coalition would win a majority. That means that they would win 76 more or more seats. Two is that Labor would win a majority. They'd win 76 or more seats. And three is that neither party would win 76 or more seats because enough would go to the crossbench. And that means politics gets involved in who decides who the winner is. And so I wasn't interested in that, so I had three outcomes. One coalition winning, two ALP winning, and three minority government. Um, so working backwards, we want to know who the winner is. We need to know who the, num the number of seats that each party wins. And Australia is a little bit weird in that it has preferential voting. So not many places around the world have preferential voting. And that means when people go to vote, they don't just indicate their most preferred candidate. They number their candidates from most to least preferred. And that means that rather than calculating um, the primary vote or who people are picking first, what's really, really important when you're trying to determine the margin between the two major parties is this thing called the two-party preferred vote, which is how much they prefer one of the major parties versus another. A few of the seats that we're not really going to deal with today go to the crossbench, but most seats are determined by this two-party preferred vote. And that's usually represented by two numbers, the coalition two-party preferred, so they might have 55%, and the ALP two-party preferred, which is 45%. But those two numbers always add up to 100. And so rather than using two numbers, we'll use one number today, and that's the two-party preferred margin. And I've arbitrarily defined that as being when that's positive, the coalition has more two-party preferred vote, and when that's negative, the LP has more two-party preferred vote. And I've simply done that because it means that on the number line, the coalition is on the right and the Labor Party is on the left. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so 
we want to get to who the winner is, we need to know the number of seats. To get there, we're going to get the two-party preferred vote. And to do that helpfully, polling companies go out and ask people who they're going to vote for, and then they estimate the two-party preferred vote from that. Um, oh, I just wanted to take a quick moment to, I guess, lay out some of the different places of uncertainty that can go into this system, which we're trying to model. We, we might not capture all of these different places of uncertainty, but we're trying to do. So polls have sampling error because they're only going to a small number of people and then trying to extrapolate what's happening in the whole country. They all also have other types of survey error where people don't have landline phones anymore, so that skews who they actually end up speaking to. We also have polls being taken at a particular point in time, and so people change their mind from that. Also, the relationship between the two-party preferred vote and the number of seats a party wins isn't always uniform, and so we need to calculate uncertainty in that relationship too. So all these different things can cause different election results from the same set of polling data, and it's really important to take note of that. Um, so this is the not quite the full model. There are a few bits and pieces that I just don't have time to go through today. But I'm going to basically step us through two different, two mini models today, uh, and then take us back and bring it all together. So if you're following along, um, you might just want to stay on this slide. But you can see here we aggregate the polling data, and so this is one little model. And then here we estimate the relationship between the two-party preferred margin and the seat margin, and that's a second model. And then the rest of this is just bringing those two models together and then doing some math to work out how many seats each of the parties won. I'll go through that step by step now. And this is the output that we get at the end of it. So we get an estimate of the number of seats that the ALP will win, an estimate of the number of seats that the coalition or the Liberal National Coalition, LNC as I put there, um, an estimate of the number of seats that will be won by the crossbench, and also an estimate of the two-party preferred margin. And here I've put the actual results from the election as a yellow bar on each. We'll get into that in a bit more detail. So how do we build a model in PyMC3? First of all, what is PyMC3? So PyMC3 is a probabilistic library. Um, it uses uh, a mathical, mathematical method called Markov Chain Monte Carlo, which is a, a sampling method. So rather than trying to do explicit calculations of the uh, distributions of probability from the data that it has, it samples those. Um, and the great thing about PyMC3 is if none of what I just said made sense to you, it doesn't have to because it's left the maths to the mathematicians and it lets scientists do their modeling. I mean, we all want to be careful and understand the methods that we're using, but um, it's just, it's made it really, really straightforward and it, I think it puts the right decisions in a modeler's hands. Uh, PyMC3 uses the Bayesian method to, do, um, to build a model, so we need to specify three things. Firstly, we need to specify a prior, which is what we think could be possible before we've shown our model any data. We give it our data, and we also spe specify a likelihood that takes our prior and transforms it based on our observations and gives us what's called a posterior distribution of probability, which is our assumptions and our data combined. So first, our first little mini model is trans bringing poles together. So transferring poles into uh, the, an estimate of the two-party preferred vote, but as a probabilistic estimate. So not just an average of those, but um, what possible outcomes there could be for the two-party preferred vote. So there's a fair bit going on here. I'll just take you through it step by step. So across the bottom, we have five different polling firms. So News Poll, Central Galaxy, Ipsos, and Morgan. So they're different companies that go into and call people or ask people in person what they're intending to vote for. On the x-axis, we have the two-party preferred margin. And so again, coalition is up the top, and the ALP is down the bottom. Each of the dots here represents one poll. And I've adjusted these polls based on the historical performance of each of the pollsters at different points. So um, the size of the circle is actually based on how much that, uh, 
how consistent that pulsar has been in the past. So larger circles have less weight in the model and tighter circles have more weight because they've been more consistent in the past. And I put three lines here. One is the raw polling mean. So that's before I've done any adjustment to the poles, what they were saying was going to happen. And this is just a point estimate. The second is the mean, a point estimate of the uh, adjusted poles. And the purple line there is the actual result. So you can see that not too many of the poles, particularly before adjustment, were predicting anything like the coalition victory that happened. What we're trying to do is combine these poles into a single probability estimate of the two-party preferred vote. So first we've got to specify our prior, and we do that here with our first little bit of PyMC3 code. So PyMC3 uses this with context to hold its models together and keep things consistent. This means that in the same, um, yeah, you can have multiple models at the same time in different with contexts. Um, and PyMC3 comes with a bunch of distributions inside of it, one of which is a uniform distribution. And here we've specified that the lower limit is going to be minus one and the upper limit is going to be one. And then uh, I can run this so that, oh, I can't run this, goodness. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I won't run anything more today. <laughs> um, so you can see here is a representation of that sampled um, prior. So minus one is where the Labour Party has won 100%. Everyone in the country voted for the Labour Party. Plus one is where everyone in the country voted for the coalition. And then you have all the different possible outcomes in between. And on the y-axis, you have the relative probabilities of those two outcomes. And so this is our prior. So we're not, this is what's called an uninformative prior. We're not actually telling the model anything except that the value has to sit between minus one and one. And we could come up with something more informative if we had a little birdie tell us one thing, we could specify it so that there was more of the distribution towards the ALP or towards the coalition, but we're just being agnostic at this point and saying that it's between minus one and one. And then we're gonna specify our, uh, our likelihood and add our data to get our posterior distribution for the two party preferred margin. So we've got that same line specifying our prior and here we put our prior into this normal likelihood. So assuming that those, the distribution is going to be normal and that's another assumption that we're making. And then we're putting our observed two party preferred adjusted here and the standard deviation, as I said before, which is the weighting of those different poles. And here I've put the prior and the thing to really take note of here is how wide the x-axis is, so it goes all the way from minus one to one. Whereas once we've updated our prior and got our posterior di distribution based on the observed data, this is shrunk down markedly, but it's still a distribution of possible two-party preferred margins. And I've also noted here the actual outcome. And so I would say that this is a pretty shoddy estimate of the two-party preferred because it doesn't contain any probability distribution near the actual outcome. And so, um, yeah, uh, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, so the question is, can we take this shoddy estimate of the two-party preferred margin and use it to forecast um, the number of seats that are gonna be won by the two parties at the election? So we set that aside, we set our polls aside, and now we're gonna look at a different data set which is historical election results. And we're gonna see, is there a relationship between the actual historical election results and the number of seats that are won by the two major parties at an election? And so that looks like this. So across the x-axis, we've got the two party preferred margin. And across the y-axis, we've got the seat margin. And you can see that our democracy is working in some ways in that the more two party preferred margin you win, the more votes you win in a sense, the more seats you win, and the vice versa also works. And so if we wanted to build a pretty straightforward model, we could fit a line of best fit through those data points and come up with uh, a model where we can take a point on the two party preferred line and look across and see what that predicts in terms of seat margin, but we're not trying to do lines of best fit, we're, well, we're not trying to do a line of best fit, we're trying to look at the possible outcomes 
for those. So fitting this line of best fit, we get a slope of 3.05 and we get an intercept of 0 0.03. Thinking probabilistically though, we're gonna go through the same process that we went through just before, specifying priors. So here we specify our priors for slope, for intercept, and also for the error. So the distance points can be away from that line. And I've used normal distributions here for those, um, for those distributions. And the reason I've done that is there's no real limit on what the slope can be. It can be any real number. And similarly, the intercept can be any real number. Um, and error will be positive, but it can be any number on that line as well. And so um, rather than using a uniform distribution, I've just used a really wide uh, normal distribution. Um, yeah, so now we're gonna specify our likelihood and add in our data. So here's our model. We've got that intercept, which we've specified a prior for, the slope, which we've specified a prior for, the actual data that runs along the x-axis, and we're calling that y. And then we're putting y into our model and including our observed what we saw on the y-axis. And then we're also gonna estimate the error as we go along. And so you can see here, we've got, again, markedly shrunk um, x-axis, which are now more representative of the data, but they're still probabilistic distributions. And the great thing you can see here is that the mean perfectly matches our line of best fit estimates, but we have now have probability distributions associated with them. Um, and so what that looks like, if you take those samples and plot lines based on each of those different samples here, I've just taken 700, is that those distributions really well match and cover the data. So where there are more data points, there are more lines and the um, density of the lines is higher. And where there are less lines, um, is where there are less data points. So we quite well cover the possible outcomes in terms of this relationship between two-party preferred margin and seat margin. There's a third section to the model that I'm not going to have time to go through today. And it's actually possibly the, it's the best performing bit of the model, but you have the link and so feel free to go along and to see how it works. But it's just going through that same process of specifying a prior adding a data and some likelihood. Here we use a different likelihood, which is a binomial likelihood, and then getting a posterior distribution for the number of seats that will be won by the cross bench. So we've gone from polls to the two-party preferred vote, and then we've also gone from the two-party preferred vote to the number of seats, but we have to combine those two models together. And this is that what I showed you at the start. So again, we've got the model for the two-party preferred margin, the model for the relationship between the two-party preferred margin and the number of seats. Um, and here is the, I guess, really interesting or exciting part is that we've got things estimated from different sets of data. So the intercept and slope, which have been estimated from historical election results, and the two-party preferred margin, which has been estimated from polls, and we're bringing those things together in a probabilistic way and not losing any of our uncertainty along the way. And we've also got our error in that linear relationship that we're including here. So we're combining, we have uncertainty in all those different parameters and we're bringing all those pieces of uncertainty together and kind of making sure we don't lose any along the way. Um, and so this gives us an estimate of the seat margin between the two parties as a percentage and then the rest from here on down is really just math. So we have 151 seats. We give those seats um, that uh, we're gonna give away to the cross bench. That's the bit that I didn't show you. And then we just, it's quite generally just math that I won't go through, but to determine the number of seats um, in the Liberal National Party and the number of seats in the ALP. And here's what we get at the end. So we get an estimate of the number of seats the ALP will win. And you can see, of course, I was a little bit high on the number of seats that the ALP will win. But that, certainly that estimate is within the, what's called the credible interval, the equivalent of like an 80% confidence interval, but not quite the same thing. So that estimate is well within the, that range. Similarly, the number of seats that the Liberal National Coalition would win, that estimate was a little bit low, but within that range. 
and the crossbench was pretty much bang on. So I, possibly one takeaway is that you can have polling data that gives you a pretty poor estimate of the two-party preferred margin, but if you try and include uncertainty of other parts of the system, you can still get a reasonable estimate of what might happen, and you're not limiting yourself to one possible outcome. One thing that you're probably all asking is, well, what kind of percentages did you have on those final absolute outcomes of different things happening? So we had a, and you can calculate these super easily from the samples that you get spit out of pi MC3. Um, we had a 25% chance of a coalition win, a 35% chance of an ALP win, and a close to a 40% chance of a minority government. And certainly, I wouldn't argue that we predicted a coalition win, but when something has a 25% likelihood, it's the same as guessing the correct answer in uh, a multiple choice test. It's not far off um, it raining on a day when there's a 30% chance of rain. Um, sometimes something other than the most likely thing happens, and I think this is one of those instances, but it's important to be aware of, well, it's still certainly possible because 25% chance isn't zero chance and it's not 10% chance. So that's one of my main takeaways. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for that great talk, Martin. We've got time for one, maybe two questions. Okay. Uh, I noticed in your first prior it looked a little wobbly. Uh, wouldn't we expect a flat distribution if we're not making any assumptions? Definitely. So like, because I was going to try and run it, I just use a really small number of samples, and so that's why it's really wobbly. But when I run it live, I do 180 odd instead of six, 180 thousand odd samples instead of 6,000 samples, and so that line just really flattens out. Um. There are some other um, Python MC, MC packages like PyStan. Have you um, used those and do you have any ideas of which, which ones are more workable? And uh, I don't. This was uh, my first foray into using uh, MC packages. Um, for newcomers though, I really do recommend, so I built the whole model using this Think Bayes framework from Alan Downey, which is just a great way to get your head around Bayesian statistics. Um, and that, that doesn't have Markov chain Monte Carlo in it. It does that, you build all the um, architecture yourself. So that's a really great way to get introduced. Then if you want to get introduced to PyMC3, you can have a look at Bayesian methods. But I, sorry, I, to answer your question, I don't know between PyStan and PyMC3. So uh, first of all, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. So do you have any, any advice of, about choosing priors? <laughs> um, I, th uh, I don't know, I've, I've read a little bit about it. People say that oh, like informative priors are better when you have an opinion. I just took the view like it's, it's pretty clear that these things that, yeah, maybe you can set limits on them. So particularly the two-party preferred margin, it's pretty clear that it can be minus one or it can be one, but it, it has to be somewhere in between that range. So that's a pretty standard thing. The great thing about priors is two people can have different priors, put them both into a model, and you can see what impact your assumptions have on the actual end point, which is great. Sorry, you got... No more time for questions, but I'm sure you can find Martin in one of the breaks and ask him some more. So thank you again. And Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs>